Okay, so uh, we looked at uh, this way to reconcile um, Buddhism and uh, Confucianism, uh, but uh, let's not forget that we also want to reconcile Buddhism and Taoism. And as soon as this loads here, yeah, let's see. like I said, we can do that by thinking of the immortals. So this is one of the many um, Chinese paintings that show the immortals. Like here they're riding on dragons, which are these symbols of this kind of supernatural power that immortals and bodhisattvas seem to possess. So that's pretty cool. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Buddhism coming in with their ideas of bodhisattvas was one of the idea, one of the re reasons that um, the idea of immortals became so popular, that uh, you know both traditions helped influence each other. Um, and it's very interesting that the Taoists already ha kind of had, um, oh, I've spelled it two different ways here, but that's okay. You can spell it either way, depending on what system you use. Um, but uh, the Taoists had their own uh, kind of tradition of meditation, you know, because what is um, Taoism but trying to connect with the flow, uh, the way of the universe? And Buddhists kind of can think about that. They call it Dharma, you know, the Buddhist duty to the world. They kind of link that. Uh, to the idea of enlightenment. Um, so there's all sorts of connections that people draw here. Um, and so it's not surprising that uh, a school of Buddhism would develop that was related to this. And that's, um, we talked about this before, that's Zen Buddhism. That's what they call it in Japan, where Americans know it from, is from Japan. But in China, it's known as Chan Buddhism, uh, walking Buddhism. Um, and it, you know, involves this sort of very close paying attention to things and being t in touch with the present moment to reach enlightenment. And not just, you know, imagining a bodhisattva will do it for you, but connecting to the present moment. That's a very Taoist way of thinking about things. Um, that said, there are still, you know, conflicts and there's still people who see those things as very different, but it is pretty interesting. Um, and I kind of feel like the koans that uh, Zen Buddhists come up with are very similar to the work of Zhuangzi, who uh, uh, was the second of the big uh, Taoist philosophers we looked at. He was the guy who's like, am I a man dreaming I'm a butterfly or am I a butterfly dreaming I'm a man? You know, he likes those weird concepts that like make you think and let you kind of get outside of your own head and sort of think about things in a totally different way. So, yeah, even though there's this time period of these persecutions, honestly, the Tang Dynasty is sometimes seen as a golden age for Buddhism because it really grows in China and is really successful in so many different ways. Uh, but yeah, so let's think about how these different themes uh, might appear in art, because the art of the Tang Dynasty is really interesting. Um, well, and the Song Dynasty. I guess it's really the Song who um, carry it uh, fully um, into kind of its final form. So look at these paintings here. Um, these are all paintings on silk. And what do you notice about them? What kind of themes do they seem to be going towards, and what do they make you feel? Um, what I notice is that there's these big open landscapes. There's a lot of sort of bendy, crooked old trees. Um, there's a lot of mountains. Uh, you can kind of see, yeah, mountains back there too. This is a style of art that China becomes really known for in the Song Dynasty. Um, the, this art with these big open spaces and a lot of focus on nature. Sometimes you'll see like a temple. This is a Buddhist uh, pagoda, which is kind of like a stupa in housing the relics from a holy bodhisattva. Um, and sometimes you'll see monks, or sometimes you'll just see nature by itself. And look, the monk is there, but he's not, you know, the whole point of the scene. He's, he's small in comparison to the landscape, and so is the temple. So it seems like there's a lot of different ideas from all of these different traditions going on in these silk paintings. Um, you've got the idea of emptiness, which is common in both uh, Buddhism and Taoism. You know, that uh, we kind of find the emptiness in things to find what we're looking for. Um, and uh, the Confucian idea of nature is super important. And Taoism and Buddhism have a little bit of nature as well, but it really comes out most from uh, the Confucian ideas. And I guess kind of from the original religion of, the, uh, of nature as well. But yeah, this is the art that um, the Song Dynasty becomes known for. Um, it also becomes known for calligraphy. Um, so a really common thing to do is to write uh, poetry during this time period. And the poetry expresses a lot of the same themes. The idea of emptiness, the idea of beauty, uh, the idea of sort of stillness and peace. Uh, they all come across in the writing. Uh, this one right here is 
a description of the Orchid Pavilion, so a sort of beautiful garden place um, being discussed in the Tang Dynasty. Um, and even better, uh, it's not just that the thing that you're describing is beautiful, you also try to make your writing very beautiful as well. And that's what we call uh, calligraphy. Uh, I think we last talked about that when we talked about Islam. Again, you have a very beautiful calligraphy uh, in Arabic, using the writing itself as a kind of art, which is something that Arabic does when they don't have as much uh, visual depiction. Um, uh, sorry, that I Islam does when they don't have as much visual depiction. But in China, they do both. Um, they have beautiful writing and beautiful uh, art as well. And sometimes they have them both together. So you'll make a painting of a scholar in a meadow, um, some sort of nature scene, some sort of maybe monk type of person. Uh, this is from the Song Dynasty, uh, from being like the year 1000 or so. Um, and the writing is there. It's describing that same scene, maybe adding a little bit commentary. So you've got the beauty of the writing. You've got the beauty of, beauty of the poem that's being told. And you've got the beauty of the art all in the same work. That's a pretty powerful combination. Um, and yeah, the poetry continues these themes. There's some lovely poems um, that are in the book, um, and they show how uh, Chinese poetry during this time period focuses really on ordinary life. Um, and it's not really about um, Buddhism directly. It's not saying, you know, this is the path to enlightenment. It's more about this is what my life is like. But it sort of connects to some of these same ideas, um, these ideas of emptiness, uh, Buddhism and Taoism both have the idea that things are temporary and they're going to pass away, so you got to sort of enjoy them while you can. Or, or well, that's more of a Taoist idea, but, uh, you know, that things are, are very temporary and, you know, there's a sadness to the world and that everything goes away. Um, and the Confucian idea that relationships are really important, the relationships you have with your friends, the relationships you have with your family um, and nature, they're all themes that appear here. So we've got this lovely poem about uh, the spring rain um, saying that you come at the right time and then you wet the world, you darken the roads um, and fill the city with red flowers that are glistening. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, so, you know, just kind of capturing this moment. That's kind of the goal of poetry here. Um, and it's interesting that um, poetry is kind of a sign that you're very classy. We talked about this with the test, that you actually have to write poetry for the tests. It's long been this sort of mark of being a cultured, elegant person, that you can make these elegant uh, little uh, poems about uh, these scenes. Um, but now it's even more so. But there's also novels. Um, there's stories about uh, people's day-to-day -day lives, a lot like our novels, you know, talking about sort of ordinary life and how people are living it. And I think it connects to these ideas of what things in life are important, you know, even when you're not engaging with religion directly, you still have connections to all these things. Another great poem is um, this uh, poem of a farewell. It says, uh, what holiday will see us drunk together again? Last night we walked arm in arm in the moonlight, singing sentimental ballads along the banks of the river. Your honor outlasts the three emperors. I go back to my lonely house by the river, mute, friendless, feeling the years. So that's a poem about, you know, saying goodbye to a friend, maybe for a long time. And, you know, it just, just captures this really, you know, this feeling of the sort of the loss and the temporary wis uh, temporariness of it all and the wistful feeling that you have when you're parted. It says a lot, and you can kind of feel this person's, uh, you know, thoughts and feelings even today. So um, literature is a big part of life. Uh, poems and stories, uh, they really affect how people feel and how people think and how they live, and it's connected to all these same ideas. I mentioned also that, um, that a lot of the writers during this time period are women, which is a pretty cool thing, that women are writing a lot of poetry and writing a lot of novels in uh, Chinese text. Yes, and uh, another piece of art here, uh, we've got uh, the Buddhist immortals. So I just thought this is pretty cute, this sort of theme of ordinary life. Well, here are the immortals. Uh, you could read them as the Taoist immortals or the Bodhisattvas, kind of both at this time period. And they're doing their laundry on the mountain. Um, so that's kind of, you know, even, even immortal people have to do laundry. Like their clothes aren't immortal. So, you know, they still got to take care of that. Must be annoying when you live for thousands of years. Okay, 
And now an, uh, another theme I want to talk about is sort of uh, women's lives in uh, the Tang and Song dynasty. So one of the things that um, in Chinese history is sort of notorious is uh, foot binding. And this doesn't happen until relatively late in Chinese history, but it happens, starts happening in, near the end of the Song dynasty. So we can talk about it in our course. Um, and it's a practice of, you know, um, from when girls are very young, binding their feet so that they don't grow properly. It actually breaks the foot and compresses the feet so that they actually don't work properly. So women who grow up with this can can barely walk and sometimes have to be carried around. It's not good. It's not, you know, advisable in any way. Um, uh, but there's a big debate over, you know, to what degree is it like men trying to control women? To what degree is it like a fashion thing that got out of hand? Um, I think one thing to remember is most women weren't doing this. It was just the upper classes. So the upper class families would um, uh, do this to their daughters. Um, and it was a symbol of being a member of this upper class. You know, because if you think about it, what is what does it say if a woman can't walk? Um, well, she's not going to be able to, you know, be a farmer or anything like that. So it's a sign that you're not a farmer. It's a sign that you get to stay indoors and that you're rich enough to be carried around all over the place. Um, so uh, this kind of extreme exaggerated beauty, which makes your foot only like four inches long, which is wild. Um, you know, it's also a sign of where you are in society and people kind of showing off in a way. Um, and so effectively it puts women on a pedestal, almost literally, because they, they can't travel around on their own. Or they can walk a little bit, but not without a lot of pain. And, you know, it's pretty limited. Um, now here's the weird thing, is that these women, we would say this is pretty oppressive, right? This is pretty negative, this is pretty bad, and pretty horrifying. But it's the same women who are writing these poems and writing these novels that have still stuck with us today. So in a lot of societies, you know, women aren't supposed to write. Women aren't supposed to be writers or authors or poets. Not in Chinese society. So they have a lot of freedom to be writers, but that's kind of the only freedom that they have. They can tell these stories but they don't um, have the ability to walk around. So one hand, something we would say is great is their ability to write and to communicate. On the other hand, uh, they don't have the ability to uh, move around. Um, so societies can be very different and approach things in very different ways. Um, I think today it's kind of a negative stereotype of China a little bit, um, but I think it's a little bit more complicated when you think about what lives were these women actually living. They were very connected to each other and to the world through literature, but in another way, they were very disconnected. So yeah, a lot to think about there. Okay, let's see what we have time for still in this video. Um, yeah, you know what? I'm going to hold off here and then we'll do one more video talking about inventions and exploration during the Song Dynasty.